we are thrilled to have with us um, Glenn Kessler and Angie and Angie Drobnik Um They are the two best fact checkers in the business. Glenn is the chief writer and and an editor of the fact checker at the Washington Post. He's had a long distinguished career at the Post, including covering the State Department and other um, and other important institutions. Angie is the editor in chief of PolitiFact. She is on the advisory board of the International Fact Checking Network. She has extensive fact checking experience in covering all, all aspects, uh, all institutions in Washington. Um, we're gonna hear from them. Uh, they're gonna kind of talk about the fact checking process, how it works, and then we'll have plenty of time for questions. So with that, I will turn it over to Glenn and Angie, and I'm not sure who of the two of you wants to go first. Angie, if you could maybe just, <clears throat> For, for our fellows here <clears throat> who um, haven't been around the world as long as we have been, um, give us a little bit of history of, of fact checking and kind of how, how you guys came about and had a, how the fact checking movement kind of came about. Yes, uh, happy to do that. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about fact checking and its place in political journalism today. And then I have a few examples I wanna show you and a couple of tips and tricks and then I'll toss it back over to Glenn. Um, I do hope we've got an hour and I do hope we can finish early enough to get a lot of questions because frankly, right. that's always the most enjoyable part of this for me. Um, I looked through all your biographies and I thought it was really interesting all the different news organizations you come from and some of them uh, we've partnered with before or in the past, uh, PolitiFact has. Um, so I'm gonna assume most of you have basic familiarity with fact checking. Um, just to give you my story, in 2007, I was working in the Tampa Bay Times newsroom uh, along with uh, Tia Mitchell, who's here. Got to give Tia a shout out. And um, the idea was born for PolitiFact by the Washington bureau chief, uh, Bill Adair, because he was upset that there was so much messaging going on during elections that was not being contested. And one of the prime examples of this would be like uh, John Kerry when he ran in 2004 and a group called the Swift Boat Veterans for Truth. I don't know how many of you have read about that or remember that, um, but basically it was a group that formed to undermine um, John Kerry's war record by basically lying about it. And the media um, in Bill's view didn't do a very good job of uh, fact checking it. So he hoped in 2008 to launch a new website, PolitiFact, that would be very aggressive and entirely focused on refereeing campaign messaging on both sides. Like Glenn's video, we're nonpartisan, um, but uh, we do fact check all the sides. And Bill wasn't the only one thinking that. In 2007, the Washington Post also launched the fact checker, factcheck.org, which is another like really good fact checking website, uh, had been around uh, for a couple of years before that. And it just kind of coalesced into a moment where a lot of American political journalism became very interested in, in fact checking. And we went through a couple of election cycles. And then of course, in 2016, we had Donald Trump come on the scene. We had the explosion of social media and um, there was just a need for fact checking uh, like never before. Uh, PolitiFact um, has expanded over the years. We have about 15 journalists, we post anywhere between five and 10 fact checks per weekday. Um, we also are part of a partnership with Facebook. So we fact check a lot of false messaging on social media. So in the course of your reporting, if you ever have to debunk something weird that was seen on the internet or address it, PolitiFact has probably, <laughs> probably touched it in some uh, form or fashion. And so now we're here in 2021, and I would say fact checking has become thoroughly integrated into most political journalism. So uh, I, I was reading a, a profile um, today of the Congressman Madison Cawthorn in the Post, and as they were telling his life story and some of the things he said on the campaign trail, the, the story was constantly interjecting like, uh, facts don't show this. This is contradicted by court records. This is not true. The election was not rigged. And I can't tell you what a sea change that is since uh, in, my, in my career, um, I'm 48, just to give you a sense of, uh, it, it used to be that 
the press was once at one time much more restrained about fact checking. Now they're not. I would submit that's a good thing. And I would suggest that you all should look for ways to integrate fact checking into your reporting. Uh, I think it's really um, journalistic malpractice to repeat things that we know to be false without correcting them in our stories. And um, I think that's where we've ended up in a really good place. So I just wanna give you a sense of the breadth of PolitiFact's work with a few examples. So PolitiFact does a lot of public policy fact-checking. We do a lot of messaging fact-checking. We do a lot of social media fact-checking. And the way we select items to check is that we follow the mainstream political news and we look for topics that are in the news. So this is a fact check we did. I'm, I'm just gonna hit the highlights here. This is Glenn Beck. He says, just for the record, the Biden administration is separating children and families. We rated it false. Um, if you're on the webpage on our site, you get a little, if your time is short, that hits the highlights. Um, the rest of the report is all about where the item was said and we list all of our sources. And for fellow journalists, I want to really encourage you like use our fact checks, look at our source list, take it for your own reporting when you need it. Um, this one, we went through what the, um, what the current Biden policy is, what the previous policy was. It's very wonky, um, very fact oriented. And if you're writing about this topic, you can use this fact check as a tip sheet to kind of inform your own reporting. So this, we also fact checked a lot of pundits and this is Tucker Carlson, probably like I would rate him the number one pundit right now as far as influence and reach. Uh, I spoke with a fact checker in Croatia recently who told me that Tucker Carlson was being subtitled into Croatian and shared <laughs> on Facebook there. So this one is, he says, the Green New Deal came to Texas, the power grid in the state became totally reliant on windmills. Now this is the kind of check that if you run into it in your reporting, you might be like, that doesn't sound right, but I'm not exactly sure why it is or isn't. Well, PolitiFact will tell you exactly why it is or isn't. Our report goes through this. It talks about what the Green New Deal is. It's not an existing law. It's more like an idea. Um, it didn't have anything to do with Texas, which is not reliant on windmills. Uh, just we interview uh, power authorities in Texas. We, you know, we interview energy experts on the ground in Texas. We go through what the official agency said, the whole nine yards. So if you're dealing with windmills called the Tex cause the Texas power outage, this is your, again, this is a tip sheet. Let's go to the next one. Uh, this is our principles for the truth -o meter This covers a lot of, um, of the principles that Glenn talked about. I mean, sometimes I get this question of who fact checks the fact checkers. And my answer to that is everybody. I can't tell you the amount of scrutiny we get and uh, like um, compliments and criticisms galore on Twitter. Uh, there are misinformation sites that sometimes I feel like they've made it their cause in life to say nasty things about fact checkers. But uh, thanks to our principles, I feel like we're pretty, um, pretty well defended. We're nonpartisan, PolitiFact's owned by the Pointer Institute. Um, we believe in transparency. We're part of this international fact checking network, which um, I wish all journalists had an association they could belong to like this one because um, they've created a code of principles that we can all sign up for and um, so we have a lot of discussions among the fact-checking organizations about best practices. Um, PolitiFact has an ethics policy. Um, we choose the, we lay out how we choose claims to fact-check, which is things that are in the news and things that sound wrong. Um, all that stuff is based basically right here. Okay, now this is one of the best tips that I have for you guys, which is like, so you're busy, you're on deadline. This is called the Fact Check Explorer. And if you Google, Google Fact Check Explorer, you'll find the URL. Um, and I did uh, send it, so maybe you'll get that later. But if you just put any kind of keywords into this box, this is a Google supported search box, you'll get back fact checks from the fact checkers. I have to tell you, even I struggle to find our content sometimes because like we do so many fact checks and um, Google search results. If you just do a Google search um, 
for like PolitiFact content, it'll usually just give you like the top two. I mean, it's not, this is a more in-depth tool when you're looking for fact-checking content. The other thing I suggest is, I don't know, I hope all of you know the site, S-I-T-E colon politifact.com where you can restrict to one domain and then do your keyword search. I guess that's, I'll go back to Glenn, but I will say like this fact checking is very important uh, to PolitiFact. I think it's important to American journalism and anything I can do to help you, um, you can email me, anything I can do to encourage um, fact checking because I really do think it's in this day and age, um, it's so necessary. The number one message I hear from from our audiences, I don't know who to trust. And they like PolitiFact's method because we're, we put so much emphasis on the transparency of the conclusions and on the hyperlinks to sources. So the idea is that anybody can replicate our fact checks for themselves. So over to you, Glenn. All right. Uh, so uh, as Angie was saying that increasingly um, fact checking is incorporated as part of news reporting. And um, I feel like I've now been doing this for just over 10 years at the Washington Post. And um, I feel like it has definitely become increasingly integrated um, in the coverage at the Washington Post so much that there's some days I wake up and say, oh my goodness, they already took our possible fact check because it's someone else did it. Um, uh, but, you know, in, we also got very used to the practice during the Trump presidency of simply saying in the course of a news story what the president said was false, which was, you know, really not as routine as before. It was probably less necessary. Um, but, you know, they would say it was false and they would either link to our fact check. Uh, if they linked to, sometimes they would link to a PolitiFact fact check. And I have to admit that if it's something that I had already fact-checked, I would send a little note to say, please switch the link. But it's just a matter of course of trying to uh, incorporate uh, a, it's, basic, it's basic due diligence in fact-checking, a basic due diligence in reporting. And one thing I've learned in the 10 years of doing this is that sometimes you discover that some reporters are just kind of lazy about checking facts. And uh, they'll assume because someone said it or it was cited in a report, they don't really check whether or not that's accurate. Uh, just last year, we had a front page story in the Washington Post where it had some statistic, which on the face of it made no sense, which, is, which was that more than 75% of women who migrated through Mexico were raped. It cited it to uh, Amnesty International. And when I started digging into it, it turns out it was not even though it had been widely reported as something from Amnesty International, it had not been an Amnesty International report. And I followed the footnotes, eventually traced it to a book that had been written 30 years earlier, which had said that 75% of women traveling from Mexico had a sexual experience during their trip, including having a boyfriend. And somehow over the years, it had morphed into a, a rape statistic. So you just have to always double check uh, the facts. And I'll, I, I have a couple of slides myself. I'll quickly run through them and then we can go to questions. If we queue up those, so just to mention a few of the recent types of fact checks we've done. So um, briefly, one of the big projects we did um, during the Trump presidency was to track every false or misleading claim that President Trump made. And originally this was done um, because, you know, the core as the video said, the core thing we do at the, at the fact checker <clears throat> is mainly write about policy issues and use the fact checks to demystify policy. And we were suddenly encountered with Trump who um, a lot of what he said that was wrong had little to do with policy. It was just you know, stuff he made up. And he was constantly saying stuff and constantly repeating stuff where he'd already fact checked. So the idea was how do we avoid having, you know, him take us away from his, our core mission. And we said, well, just start this list. And you know, a lot of things we could just say, oh, it is a stupid tweet. We'll just put it in the database. Um, and it started as a hundred day project. He said like a little under 500 false things in a uh, hundred days. And it seemed manageable. So I decided we keep it going, which was probably one of the biggest mistakes of my life because the guy just went insane. Um, 
and um, it became so overwhelming, it almost ate the fact checker, it just trying to keep up with the verbiage of the president. So, you know, you see there, the, the final count was a little over 30,000. He'd only hit 20,000 in July of last year, which meant he did, there were another 10,000 in the last six months of his presidency. And um, I, in order to, so just a statistic, the last two weeks of the presidential campaign, he said 370,000 words because he was doing like four or five rallies a day and tweeting constantly. So in order for me to get through those final two weeks, I literally had to work 16 straight days from 9 a.m. to 11 p.m., breaking only for meals. And I did take Christmas day off and New Year's Eve off. But otherwise, it was 16 straight days of, of work. Um, it was just insane. So uh, I, <laughs> people keep asking me, well, are you going to do a tracker for Biden? And like, and no, I will never do something like this ever again. <laughs> but it did become a statistic that is used quite a bit. And there's been a lot of research that's been done on this. I mean, we have a little link there. You, anyone can download now the full database. And, and you know, I say, let 100 PhD dissertations bloom. Um, but it was truly uh, if I'd known what it was going to become, I never would have done it. So we get the next slide now. Uh, I want to just show this. This is, you know, we have a new president uh, who uh, his staff is trying to keep him. Uh, he doesn't talk nearly as much as Trump. His speeches are relatively short. They're basically vetted and fact-checked, though he though sometimes goes a bit over the line uh, uh, if he's at a town hall. There's more fodder because uh, he doesn't have a script in front of him. Uh, but, uh, and I've known Joe Biden for 25 years. The guy is a gaff machine. And this was one of my favorite things where he claimed he was, uh, this was in the campaign last year, he claimed he was arrested while tra trying to see Nelson Mandela. But it was weird because he talked about, uh, he was trying to, he was arrested in Soweto about trying to see Nelson Mandela, who was actually imprisoned on Robbins Island at the time, hundreds of miles away. Um, and I interviewed, you know, he said he was arrested with the UN ambassador. I interviewed Andrew Young, the UN ambassador, said, I don't know what Joe is talking about. Eventually, his staff kind of tried to explain it, that he was separated from the Black Congressional Caucus at an airport in Loseto. But I then interviewed the members of that delegation. They all said it wasn't true. So it was just something completely made up by Biden. Um, but uh, his his you know flights of fancy are not are not as kind of mean or vindictive as Trump's are. So maybe he gets away with a little bit more. But anyway, I, this is, was one of my favorite fact checks last year because no matter how you try to unravel it, there was virtually no basis for him to make this claim. And he didn't just say it once, he didn't just say it twice, he actually said it three times. So you, you know, my, I have a bit of a standard, like you, you can just get off base once or maybe twice, but if you start saying three times, clearly you actually believe this and you need to be held account for it. Uh, next slide. Uh, so this again was one of my favorite fact checks from last year. And this is just, um, um, it, it, was, it was about a guy running for Senate, very wealthy lawyer who claimed he'd set up a foundation that helped inner city kids. And he was going around New Hampshire saying he'd done this great thing. And this is an example of where the, the, the information to debunk something can be sometimes so easily at your fingertips. Because he was saying this, it, it was being reported in the New Hampshire press, there was a guy who, for 10 years, he'd been, um, you know, uh, helping inner city kids with this foundation that he funded with his own money. Well, it's a foundation. So there, there's something called 990 forms, tax forms on the internet, easily found, which apparently no one had bothered to do. Turns out, um, you know, he, first of all, it wasn't his money. It was his law firm's money. Secondly, they weren't making any uh, 
for virtually no uh, awards to anyone for, the, for 10 years. It only started to really happen when he decided to run for the Senate. And my favorite part of it was the biggest expense they had spent was to uh, pay for a uh, baseball field at an elite private school that his children attended, not inner city schools or anything like that. It was all right there. Anyone in the New Hampshire press in, in, a, in an hour of digging would have had all this at their fingertips. Um, but, you know, people were busy and they're just writing about politicians and just, so a lot, I just mentioned this because it was a fun piece and it was like relatively easy fact check to do uh, because that information was available. It's just that people didn't know where to look to actually vet whether or not he was saying it was true. Um, and I don't know, I, I think I have one more slide. Yeah. Yes, okay. So, and then I just mentioned this one. Uh, now, you know, it's interesting. There's now been a, a rule instituted at the Washington Post. We can no longer have question mark headlines. So this, this would violate that rule. Uh, and it's actually a good rule, actually, because it forces you to not wimp out with a thing like this. But um, this is an interesting case where you know, we went against the conventional wisdom. There was a conventional wisdom that, uh, you know, Donald Trump eliminated this global pandemics office, the National Security Council, and that made them less effective in dealing with the pandemic. And on the face of it, that sounds right. But actually, when we dug into it, it turned out that it was seriously overstated by the Democrats about what the impact of this was and whether or not it made much of a difference. Uh, we didn't in the end come up with a ruling at the end, the, the, the Pinocchio rating. Uh, we left it unrated, which we sometimes do, but it was a much more complex issue. And it was interesting because we talked to many, many people and it was more along the lines of, I mean, the office was not really, it was a lot of it, boxes moving, you know, people moving around within different boxes but the expertise was there. And actually the deputy national security advisor uh, uh, under Trump was extremely attuned to uh, what was going on in China because he had been a Wall Street Journal reporter and had covered the SARS pandemic. So it's not like they actually at that, uh, at the NSC, they were not um, uh, aware and closely involved and whether, and it, it, in fact, the position of that Deputy National Security Advisor was more important than whether or not you had that particular uh, office there. Um, it, you know, the problem was, was, of course, was Trump. He was a, you know, he wasn't interested in it, and so therefore, they, even if you had the office, it wouldn't have made much of a difference. But again, it's just an example of how you have to always question the spin coming from one from either side because. Um, you know, my experience is it doesn't matter if they're a Democrat or a Republican, uh, they will, uh, you know, stretch the truth if they think it gives them a political advantage. And uh, that's it, I think, for my slide package. And we should probably go to questions. Okay, we have plenty of time for questions. Um, and we will go to Arjun first. Um, thank you both for being here and taking the time to talk to us. I wanted to ask first about. Um, you know, referencing the work that PolitiFact does with Facebook and this idea of Facebook so and other social media companies taking on more of a responsibility to deal with misinformation. But I'm curious as to one, how that should be employed. You know, as some of the things Glenn just referenced that last slide, there can be some difficult nuances in applying kind of a heavy handed, this is affirmatively a piece of false news that's put out for misinformation, or this is a collective difficulty of understanding what the actual ground truth at the bottom of the answer is. So I'm wondering if both of you first feel that social media companies should take an active role in actually taking out content from their websites that would fall under fake news, misinformation, and you know how you guys think that that should happen if you do you know, considering the amount of time you guys have to just spend in your own fact checks, how would, you know, social media companies go about that? Um, I think that social media companies do have an obligation to uh, police their own platforms. Um, what we're seeing is that they take a variety of different 
approaches and practices. So you, it's hard to speak like monolithically about them as a group. Um, Facebook has put a lot of effort into um, uh, labeling things. They don't take a lot of stuff down as far as the fact checking program goes um, because uh, they say, you know, that for all the reasons you would think they don't want to censor. So a typical experience of a Facebook user with one of our checks is they, they see a message, there's a grayed out screen over it. It says, fact checkers have disputed this. Do you still want to see it? Or do you want to see the fact checks? So you can click through to see the message. You can click through to see the fact checks. And then they like downgrade virality. Now, Facebook has these other, like they, they, they create these other criteria to remove content. So they have removed some content that they, that Facebook deems harmful. So like uh, kind of like anti-vaccine information, I believe they've removed. They did take steps to remove QAnon content. Um, that's a little, that is separate from our fact checking program. And that's just Facebook. Um, we also partner with TikTok. TikTok has a different approach. They don't do any kind of screens or like they, they just, I mean, I guess, I don't want to speak for TikTok, but I think that they either downgrade content and in some cases remove it. I'm not sure how they make those decisions. What we do with TikTok is TikTok sends us posts to PolitiFact. And just to be clear, the, I don't think the, I'll let Glenn speak for himself, but I don't think the Washington Post does any of this kind of work. But TikTok sends us posts and we send them back um, uh, a category and annotation. So we'll either say misinformation likely misinformation, not misinformation, or NA, which means like, is kind of a catch-all category for like, can't tell, don't know, it's not a factual statement, anything that doesn't really apply. And then TikTok takes that feedback we give them and they integrate it into their entire moderation strategy. So I, I know that's super specific. I will say like, I've been doing some monitoring of the discussions about social media because I do think it's a huge problem. Uh, the users of social media are not happy with the situation. I don't think the companies that run social media are happy with the situation. Um, there's a lot of talk in Congress about either repealing or modifying Section 230, which protects internet companies from liability. PolitiFact's going to have a story coming out on that in like maybe an hour or two that you can read if you want some more background on it. Um, I do think it's a complicated situation, but I also think that it is often confused because people talk about it as a first amendment situation. Because it's private companies, it's not necessarily a first amendment situation because it's the government that cannot suppress viewpoints. Um, and, uh, but like, I think that, I think that, that that we rec like a lot of people recognize that there is um, misinformation is creating a lot of problems in society that um, should, you, you know, you can't just say like, oh, well, freedom of expression, there's nothing we can do about it. Like, I think that would be the wrong approach. And uh, I wrote an op-ed for a pointer about approaches to misinformation. It was called something like um, online min misinformation needs real world solutions if you're interested in that. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that was great. I know it's a, it's like a really big, um, broad issue. So I think you touched on a lot of the good nuances in there. So thank you very much. Yeah, I'll, I'll just briefly jump in here. Uh, so the Washington Post has, this was invited to be part of the Facebook program. We declined to be part of it. Um, we've stayed more focused on, you know, since fact checker is part of the national news section of the Washington Post, we've stayed more focused on, you know, on politicians. We did, um, with a grant from YouTube, we did develop criteria for um, assessing uh, manipulated video, which has now been incorporated as part of uh, something called uh, media check, which is uh, related to those. There's a there's a whole thing called claim review where fact checks are, you know, summarized and then are used by platforms like Google and Bing. And so it, they've, we've now incorporated that as in the fact checking community is now incorporated also manipulated video and how to assess that as part of that. Um, the, you know, so 
it, you know, frankly, you know, there, there is some revenue that some fact checking organizations are able to make from working for social media companies, which is not an issue at the Washington Post these days. Uh, so we didn't feel particularly inclined to, to do that. Um, I, I, you know, on my on a personal level, the one thing that I, I, I feel that Facebook in particular, um, you know, they have this very narrow definition of, of you know, of uh, or relatively narrow de definition of the content that fact checkers can vet. So there are instances where PolitiFact or factcheck.org or someone else will say that this particular thing that is circulating on social media is false and that could be downgraded. But if a political party or a politician says that that same false thing, they seem to have a carve out for politicians and the politician gets away with saying something that has already been deemed as false by fact checkers. And um, it's kind of, to me, it's a bit like Facebook is having it both ways uh, because Frank, you know, you know, falsehoods being perpetuated by politicians uh, would have more, would seem to have more of an impact than some random social media post. Um, but I, you know, uh, I don't sense necessarily that Facebook is, is any closer to changing its policy on that. Yeah, just to chime in quickly, that is the policy. I mean, Facebook's policies in some ways are very complicated because they have all these different policies that intersect and they do have an exception to let politicians say um, what they like. Um, I should also note like the fact checkers who participate in this program, we are being compensated by Facebook um, it, we're, we find at PolitiFact that um, social media moderation is becoming one of our revenue streams. We're a nonprofit, so we're just looking for sustainability. We're not, um, we're not look, you know, we don't turn over profits to anybody, but it is, um, it is part of like a new business model for nonprofit newsrooms. And then finally, I just want to say, there's a lot of talk about Facebook. If you're writing about this issue, I would encourage you to look very strongly at YouTube because I think YouTube has escaped a lot of scrutiny um, uh, for several different reasons. But like, I, I think um, YouTube is a very problematic platform and I don't always understand why Facebook gets so much scrutiny when they're doing something and YouTube isn't doing anything. Yeah, we, uh, but <laughs> we developed this, this model for them. And as far as I know, they've not used it at all to moderate their videos. So. Okay, so let's go to um, Caroline Kelly next and, and tell the uh, speakers uh, uh, where you're from. Hi, uh, thank you so much for chatting with us uh, this morning. My name is Caroline. Uh, I'm a breaking news reporter at CNN and I cover abortion. Um, I had a quick question about, um, and forgive me if this is like kind of just niche to what I cover, but controversial like medical topics and how you address covering those. The example that comes to mind um, are these fetal heartbeat bills that we've seen coming out of a lot of states. Um, Anti-abortion advocates say, you know, that sound that you're hearing is clearly, if not actually a heartbeat, you know, symbolic of one. And so that's a fetal heartbeat, um, some, abortion rights supporters, specifically kind of OBGYNs who have gotten involved uh, in the movement say that, first of all, if it's as early as six weeks, like you can start hearing sounds very early. It's not a fetus, it's an embryo, you know, all these kind of technical medical kind of qualms with that sort of politicized framing of this type of legislation. So I'm curious how both of you address these types of, where obviously there are the way that these issues have been framed for so long and emotional kind of responses to medical procedures are kind of employed by both sides, how you kind of address um, those types of areas. Well, um, you can jump in here quickly. Um, you know, the our abortion fact checks are among our most read and most controversial. Um, and, um, we try to go where the facts lead us. Uh, and it's, you know, and you just, 
it, the important thing to remember is that um, both sides in the in the in the abortion debate play fast and loose with statistics and information, and um, there are no uh, my experience is there are no white hats or black hats here. So um, and some of our fact checks, uh, I think at point, one point. Several, several of the uh, pro-choice groups refused to talk to us anymore because they were so upset at our fact checks, though, um, uh, because we kind of went against some of the conventional wisdom that you often see. Uh, but it just was, that was where, that was where the facts took us. Um, and you have to be very careful with it. Um, you know, uh, just as a small example, um, there's a there were a number of bills having to do with uh, when the uh, you know how many weeks of, till viability, and it turns out we finally figured out that um, both sides they were talking about I, I believe it was 26 weeks but both sides were counting differently, so you know and many news reports didn't recognize that they were just using the shorthand 26 weeks, but you know the uh, the anti uh, the the pro life people had one definition, and the and the you know pro choice groups had another definition, and they were always talking past each other, and it made a difference of two weeks, um, and that actually made a difference in terms of viability. But it's just an example of how the both sides can spin you, um, and um, so it's it's you have to be really really careful reporting this stuff. Uh, but uh, the answers are there if you um, uh, can trust your sources and, and, and find people who actually know what they're talking about. But you have to be really, really careful to make sure that they're not funded by one of the other one or the other organizations. Okay, let's uh, go to. Um, oh, sorry, I just Andrew, go ahead. yeah. Um, we, we've done a number of fact checks on abortion. I would really encourage you to get in there and read all the abortion fact checks that the different groups have done and you can see the way we try to approach them. Um, we've done a lot of fact checking on born alive legislation, which interestingly, like we've been fact checking that. That was an issue when Barack Obama was a state legislator before he was a US Senator. And then recently um, Trump has been saying that Governor Ralph Northam of Virginia said that um, babies, yeah, he, well. He, he actually said he executed the baby. He said the governor of Virginia executed the baby. <laughs> it's, it's like, they're really like, they're, they're, they're really like unpleasant claims to have to examine, but there's no way around it. Like a fact check, I've, you know, we can't take a pass when those claims are made. So there's quite a bit of abortion fact checking and it's very contentious. And I would point you to, there's actually a, um, an incident where a, a very respected fact-checking group called Science Feedback fact-checked a claim that there's no such thing as a medically necessary abortion for as part of the Facebook program. And it got tremendous pushback, um, I believe including from Ted Cruz, double check me on that. Um, so like we are, the, so I guess the bottom line I would say is we are fact-checking abortion. You should look at the checks and see how we approach it, see what you think of um, we do try to do it in an even-handed scientific matter, manner, um, but they are highly controversial. Yeah, I, 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 I always cringe when we have to assign one of those. This just means nothing but trouble. Thank you. All right, let's go to Nicholas. Uh, hi, thank you so much for being here. So I had a question on, um, I guess, just the sorts of claims that get factored. I, I lost Sorry, you. Sorry, having trouble hearing me. Let me try switching. Okay. Uh, is that any better? Hello. Hello? Go ahead. You, you, okay, you started the beginning and you stated out. All right. Uh, let's try now. Is that better? Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> um, so I just had a question about the kinds of claims that get fact checked. I mean, are you ever ever worried about? elevating claims that might not otherwise have gotten as much exposure. So to take the social media checking as an example, like, okay, so Ted Cruz saying something on Facebook is one thing, but like, you know, random John Smith saying, Nancy Pelosi is, I don't know, spending social security to pay for ice cream or something. Uh, is, is that, are, are you ever worried about elevating stuff like that? Or is it 
just like this is wrong this must be like excised and like uh, fact checked we do think about amplification that's what we call it um when you're elevating something um we're a little bit different because we're not a general news organization so generally people are coming to our site for debunks um but with the facebook stuff when we fact check it um we uh put put the checks on Facebook, feed it back into Facebook, but we're not promoting the checks generally via social media. Um, so I feel like that reduces the amplification. And then we can tell from our analytics when we do this fact checking on Facebook, most people are coming to us from Facebook. It seems like most people are coming to these checks from having seen the original piece. So I would say uh, we do have to be careful about amplification but like not as much as like a general news organization where you're like, where the discussion is, should we put this on page one or not? Like we have different dynamics going on. Right, yeah. I mean, we, we generally we try to focus on important people saying imp things of importance. So, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, and it, it mean, so, and, and in fact, right now we're trying to do many, many fact checks of Democrats because the Democrats control the White House, the Senate, and the House. And um, so they're the people in power and they should be held to the most scrutiny. Um, and we're less concerned about um, random social media stuff. Unless it becomes totally viral maybe and someone asks us about it, but generally not. All right, and uh, Nicholas is from USA Today. And next question to uh, Caroline Simon, who is from CQ Roll Call. Hi, uh, thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate it. Um, one thing I worry about, and I'm sure other people worry about, is that the people who might be, who might benefit most from fact checking, are not receptive to it because they see an outlet as liberally biased. Are those people just a lost cause, or is there anything that can be done to kind of earn their trust enough for them to be receptive just to be receptive to fact checking? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I always say my fact checks are like little paper boats that I put onto a stream that goes down the river and I have no idea what happens to them. Um, there, that is a problem, uh, you know, and the Washington Post has a paywall, um, with, though there is a secret way to get around it to see my fact checks if you, if you uh, sign up for the Glenn Kessler app on Apple. Uh, but uh, don't tell anyone that. But uh, <laughs> the, uh, uh, we have a paywall and I would, uh, would think particularly in the wake of Trump, that um, our, re our subscriber list leans liberal. At least I can tell uh, because they're very angry at us for now fact-checking Democrats. Um, uh, so I don't know. I, it's, uh, you know, uh, I try to engage with people that get angry and I say, you know, read the fact checks over time and you'll see we don't have a particular bias and that sometimes they come back and say, oh, you know, you're right. I, I, I appreciate what you do. I know, fact, Angie can talk about this. I know PolitiFact had a period there where they went out to red states and tried to talk about fact checking, but I, I don't know if that necessarily resulted in more readers from those areas. Caroline, that's a great question, and we're trying we're trying to kind of address this question more in a, a couple of different ways at PolitiFact. But just the bottom line is that um, people who have the most partisan beliefs are the most resistant to fact checking. But research is starting to show that even partisan groups can receive some correction via fact checking. So it's like if you have a hundred hardcore partisans and you show them a fact check half of them will kind of uh, say like, oh yeah, I, I guess I was wrong, that kind of thing. So, so there is a lot, there is like fact check resistance, but it's not, it's not a hundred percent. The other thing is, is that there's a lot of uh, research and even neuroscience on people are, um, come to their beliefs through the influence of their groups. So to me, what that means is that we live in this kind of a uh, like information ecosphere. And the idea is if you can improve the overall environment, you may be able to um, influence people to more corrective beliefs, uh, more correct beliefs through um, almost like, like, you know, maybe they're resistant, but their best friend isn't. So the best friend gets the fact check, then they tell their friend, oh, I think we're wrong about that, that kind of thing. 
And then finally, I would say like, there are a lot of activists who think that like, if people believe correctly, correct information, they'll be liberal. And I, I, I don't see any evidence for that. So like if anybody has any kind of like thought of like, um, you know, that fact, like people still maintain conservative or liberal ideologies, outlooks, uh, be, you know, no matter what the fact checkers do. So like if that's ever, I, and I just, and I don't, I don't think that's the assumption behind your question, but I'm just saying like, we get that a lot from the audience and from people who are like, oh, well, I'm a Democrat and we all believe the facts and the Republicans don't because they're Republican. Like, I would just really push back hard against that narrative. I don't think it's true. I think people oh, yeah, can still- really, the, yeah. the Bernie Sanders people are among people least receptive to having their hero corrected. Okay, so what, what, what you're saying is the to convince the public that our fact checks are true, what we need to do is identify everybody's best friend and go to them. <laughs> And convince the best friend. Okay, last you know, question. Sorry. Yeah, I would just, just one thing. People talk about their family members who believe the fake news information. And my advice over and over again is like, just approach them in a loving and open way. Um, try not to be like, you're so dumb. <laughs> All right, last question, uh, Oma. Hi, um, I'm Oma Sadiq. Um, I work at Business Insider. Thanks so much for being here and for the work you do. Um, I wanted to actually ask about the 2020 election. So when you had to fact check sort of the day, the, the few days after the election results sort of were projected that uh, Biden had become the winner. And that's when um, Trump started amplifying, no, the election was rigged. Um, we actually won sort of claims like that. Um, and he had been floating the idea of potential voter fraud in the months before that too. But when you're in that time frame how do you reliably fact check that like what sources did you rely on because this was before judges started dismissing uh, his lawsuits before the fbi came out and said that there was no evidence of widespread voter fraud fraud so what did you rely on for your source material to sort of gain readers trust that no what the president is saying is not true I mean, our approach was that um, we're not sure what the election results are yet, but we know that he didn't win. So like our fact checking approach was to kind of use Trump's overstatement to fact check him to say like, there's no way he can say that he won the election at this point, the votes aren't counted yet. I mean, that was our approach. Now, fortunately, there was a lot of discussion about uh, this election rigging stuff before it even happened. and. Um, PolitiFact is part of the Pointer Institute, and we had two big events on how to cover elections. So I think like part of the reason that the press, fact checkers in particular, and the press in general was so like ready for these claims was because they were telegraphed in advance. And I mean, they still surprised me and shocked me on a certain level, even though like, but, but we had talked about being ready for this and knowing that knowing that it was coming and how, and going over in detail ahead of election day, how the votes would be counted and that sort of thing. So um, it, it was, we relied on the fact that, um, you know, his rhetoric that I won, this was rigged, was so over the top that like, you, you just couldn't confirm that kind of statement on election night. So hence it is likely untrue. Right, I mean, we took a similar approach. I mean, the, Trump was often his own worst enemy because his his um, rhetoric was so extreme. Uh, we also did a lot of debunking of particular viral claims on social media that that people were you know supposedly ballots being burned or ballots being lost and you know explaining that, which all eventually became part of the Trump arsenal of falsehoods. Um, and the, in retrospect, the most amazing thing about that, or most shocking thing, was it, you know it was expected that Trump would do something like this. What was not expected was that he would keep going on and on, even after, you know, I guess it was interesting. I got a call from, um, uh, you know, uh, essentially a, a very prominent uh, uh, ambassador for an embassy who was trying to write their their. Um, Report, you know, back to London, now I, I back back to their capital uh, about what the, you know, how they should assess Trump's, um, you know, attempts to 
to to block the election. And I advised, I said, you know, it'll be over in two weeks. He has no chance. It's not going to work out. Uh, and um, within 24 hours, that leader recognized Biden as the victor, um, uh, in part based on the memo they got from the ambassador. And, um, you know, and that, you know, no one at that point would have ever, ever imagined it would go on all the way to January 6th, or in fact, it's still going on. I mean, he, he repeated it yesterday. So that's the, I mean, and how do you fact check against such an obvious, crazy lie with based on, you know, nothing? It's a very hard question.